The longest day of my life began tardily. I woke up late, took too long in the shower, and ended up having to enjoy my breakfast in the passenger seat of my mom's minivan at 7.17 that Wednesday morning. I usually got a ride to school with my best friend, Ben Starling. But Ben had gone to school on time, making him useless to me. On time, for us was 30 minutes before school actually started. Because the half hour before the first bell was the highlight of our social calendars, standing outside the side door that led into the band room and just talking. Most of my friends were in band. And most of my free time during school was spent within 20 feet of the band room. But I was not in the band. Because I suffer from the kind of tone deafness that is generally associated with actual deafness. I was going to be 20 minutes late which technically meant that I'd still be 10 minutes early for school itself. As she drove, Mom was asking me about classes and finals and prom. I don't believe in prom. I reminded her as she rounded a corner. I expertly angled my raisin brand to accommodate the G-forces. I'd done this before. Well, there's no harm in just going with a friend. I'm sure you could ask Cassie Hinney. And I could have asked Cassie Hinney, who was actually perfectly nice and pleasant and cute. Despite having a fantastically unfortunate last name, I swiveled around when I heard the window open, and Margot's blue eyes were staring back at me. Her eyes were all I could see at first. But as my vision adjusted, I realized she was wearing black face paint and a black hoodie. Are you having cyber sex? She asked. I'm miming with Ben Starling. That doesn't answer my question. Perf. I laughed awkwardly, then walked over and knelt by the window, my face inches from hers. I couldn't imagine why she was here, in my window, like this. To what do I owe the pleasure? I asked. Margot and I were still friendly, I guess, but we weren't meet in the dead of night wearing black face paint friendly. She had friends for that, I'm sure. I just wasn't among them. I need your car, she explained. I don't have a car, I said, which was something of a sore point for me. Well, I need your mom's car. You have your own car, I pointed out. The thing about Margot Roth Spiegelman is that really all I could ever do was let her talk, and then when she stopped talking encourage her to go on, due to the facts that one, I was incontestably in love with her, and two, she was absolutely unprecedented in every way, and three. She never really asked me any questions, so the only way to avoid silence was to keep her talking. And so into the parking lot of Publix she said, So, right. I made you a list. If you have any questions, just call my cell. Listen, that reminds me. I took the liberty of putting some supplies in the back of the van earlier. What, like, before I agreed to all this? Well, yes. Technically yes. Anyway, just call me if you have any questions. But with the Vaseline, you want the one that's bigger than your fist. There's like a baby Vaseline, and then there's a mommy Vaseline, and then there's a big fat daddy of a Vaseline. And that's the one you want. If they don't have that, then get, like, three of the mommies. She handed me the list in a hundred dollar bill and said, That should cover it. We were driving down a blessedly empty I-4, and I was following Margot's directions. The clock on the dashboard said it was 107. It's pretty, huh, she said. She was turned away from me, staring out the window, so I could hardly see her. I love driving fast under street lights. Light, I said. The visible reminder of invisible light, that's beautiful, she said. T. S. Elliot, I said. You read it, too. In English last year, I hadn't actually ever read the whole poem that a line was from. But a couple of the parts one did read got stuck in my head. Oh, it's a quote, she said, a little disappointed. I saw her hand on the center console. I could have put my own hand on the center console and then our hands would have been in the same place at the same time. But I didn't. Say it again, she said. Part 6, Margot said once we were driving again. She was waving her fingernails through the air, almost like she was playing piano. 
Leave flowers on Karen's doorstep with an apologetic note. What did you do to her? Well, when she told me about Jace, I sort of shot the messenger. How so? I asked. We were pulled up to a stoplight, and some kids in a sports car next to us were revving their engine as if I was going to race the Chrysler. When you floored it, it whimpered. Well, I don't remember exactly what I called her, but it was something along the lines of sniveling, repulsive, idiotic, back knee ridden, snaggle toothed, fat ass bitch with the worst hair in Central Florida, and that's saying something. Her hair is ridiculous. I said, I know, that was the only thing I said about her that was true. When you say nasty things about people, you should never say the true ones, because you can't really fully and honestly take those back, you know? I mean, there are highlights. And there are streaks. And then there are skunk stripes. Tourists never go to downtown Orlando, because there's nothing there but a few skyscrapers owned by banks and insurance companies. It's the kind of downtown that becomes absolutely deserted at night and on the weekends, except for a few nightclubs half filled with the desperate and the desperately lame. As I followed Margot's directions through the maze of one-way streets, we saw a few people sleeping on the sidewalk or sitting on benches, but nobody was moving. Margot rolled down the window, and I felt the thick air blow across my face warmer than night ought to be. I glanced over and saw strands of hair blowing all around her face. Even though I could see her there, I felt entirely alone among these big and empty buildings, like I'd survived the apocalypse and the world had been given to me, this whole and amazing and endless world mine for the exploring. You just giving me the tour? I asked. No, she said. I'm trying to get to the SunTrust building. It's right next to the asparagus. Oh, I said because for once on this night, I had useful information. That's on South. I drove down a few blocks and then turned. Margo pointed happily, and yes, there, before us, was the asparagus. Sitting in the minivan with the keys in the ignition, but the engine not yet started, she asked, what time do your parents get up, by the way? I don't know, like, 6.15? It was 3.51. I mean... We have two plus hours and we are through with nine parts. I know, but I saved the most laborious one for last. Anyway, we'll get it all done. Part 10, Q's turn to pick a victim. What? I already picked a punishment. Now you just pick who we are going to rain our mighty wrath down on. Upon whom we are going to rain our mighty wrath. I corrected her, and she shook her head in disgust. And I don't really have anyone upon whom I wanted to rain down my wrath, I said, because in truth I didn't. I always felt like you had to be important to have enemies. Example, historically, Germany has had more enemies than Luxembourg. Margot Roth Spiegelman was Germany, and Great Britain, and the United States, and Tsarist Russia. Me, I'm Luxembourg, just sitting around, tending sheep and yodeling. Well, first off, we will get caught. I said, I hadn't started the minivan and was laying out the reasons I wouldn't start it and wondering if she could see me in the dark. Of course, we'll get caught. So what? It's illegal. Q, in the scheme of things, what kind of trouble can SeaWorld get you into? I mean, Jesus, after everything I've done for you tonight. You can't do one thing for me? You can't just shut up and calm down and stop being so goddamn terrified of every little adventure. And then under her breath she said, I mean, God. Grow some nuts. And now I was mad. I ducked underneath my shoulder belt so I could lean across the console toward her. After everything you did for me, I almost shouted. She wanted confident? I was getting confident. Did you call my friend's father who was screwing my boyfriend so no one would know that I was calling? Did you chauffeur my ass all around the world not because you are oh so important to me but because I needed a ride and you were close by? Is that the kind of shit you've done for me tonight? We bought dish howls at a 7-Eleven on iDrive and tried our best to wash the slime and stink from the moat off our clothes and skin. And I filled the gas tank to where it had been before we drove the circumference of Orlando. 
the Chrysler's seats were going to be a little bit wet when Mom drove to work. But I held out hope that she wouldn't notice, since she was pretty oblivious. My parents generally believed that I was the most well-adjusted and not likely to break into SeaWorld person on the planet, since my psychological well-being was proof of their professional talents. I took my time going home, avoiding interstates in favor of back roads. Margot and I were listening to the radio, trying to figure out what station had been playing, Stars Fell on Alabama, but then she turned it down and said, all in all, I think it was a success. Absolutely, I said, although by now I was already wondering what tomorrow would be like. Would she show up at the band room before school to hang out? Eat lunch with me and Ben? I do wonder if it will be different tomorrow, I said. I'd been asleep for just about 30 minutes when my alarm clock went off at 6.32. But I did not personally notice that my alarm clock was going off for 17 minutes, not until I felt hands on my shoulders and heard the distant voice of my mother saying, Good morning. Sleepyhead, uh, I responded. I felt significantly more tired than I had back at 5.55, and I would have skipped school, except I had perfect attendance. And while I realized that perfect attendance is not particularly impressive or even necessarily admirable, I wanted to keep the streak alive. Plus, I wanted to see how Margot would act around me. Margot left often enough that there weren't any fine Margot rallies at school or anything, but we all felt her absence. High school is neither a democracy nor a dictatorship, nor, contrary to popular belief, an anarchic state. High school is a divine right monarchy, and when the queen goes on vacation, things change. Specifically, they get worse. It was during Margot's trip to Mississippi sophomore year, for example, that Becca had unleashed the Bloody Ben story to the world. And this was no different. The little girl with her finger in the dam had run off. Flooding was inevitable. That morning, I was on time for once and got a ride with Ben. We found everyone unusually quiet outside the band room. Dude, our friend Frank said with great seriousness. Every morning, I now looked up through my bedroom window to check whether there was any sign of life in Margot's room. She always kept her rattan shades closed, but since she'd left, her mom or somebody had pulled them up, so I could see a little snippet of blue wall and white ceiling. On that Saturday morning, with her only 48 hours gone, I figured she wouldn't be home yet, but even so, I felt a flicker of disappointment when I saw the shade still pulled up. I brushed my teeth and then, after briefly kicking at Ben in an attempt to wake him, walked out in shorts and a t-shirt. Five people were seated at the dining room table. My mom and dad, Margot's mom and dad, and a tall, Stout African-American man with oversized glasses wearing a gray suit, holding a manila folder. We didn't have a view of the front door of the garage from my bedroom, for that. We needed to sit in the family room. So while Ben continued playing Resurrection, Radar and I went out to the family room and pretended to watch TV while keeping watch on the Spiegelman's front door through a picture window, waiting for Margot's mom and dad to leave. Detective Warren's black crown Victoria was still in the driveway. Monday morning, an extraordinary event occurred. I was late, which was normal, and then my mom dropped me off at school, which was normal, and then I stood outside talking with everyone for a while, which was normal, and then Ben and I headed inside, which was normal. But as soon as we swung open the steel door, Ben's face became a mix of excitement and panic, like he'd just been picked out of a crowd by a magician for the get-sawn-in-half trick. I followed his gaze down the hall. Denim miniskirt. Tight white t-shirt. Scoop neck. Extraordinarily olive skin. Legs that make you care about legs. Perfectly coiffed curly brown hair. A laminated button reading me for prom queen. Lacey Pemberton. Walking toward us. By the band room. After parking in my driveway, we walked across the strip of grass that separated Margot's house from mine, just as we had Saturday. Ruthie answered the door and said her parents wouldn't be home until 6. Myrna Mountain Tweezel ran excited circles around us. We went upstairs. 
Ruthie brought us a toolbox from the garage. And then we all stared at the door leading to Margot's bedroom for a while. We were not handy people, 